the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 122. Be on the lookout for a black touring car, license number unknown. The right rear wheel carrying a Stanley skidless car. Left rear wheel carrying a six fly Jupiter with a tread slightly worn. This car is worn in connection with the swing of motor officer Kramer. That's all. Rolls and clips. While gathering information from the police officers who worked on the case you are now to hear, an executive of the Rio Grande Oil Company took the opportunity to ask motorcycle policemen and the police car drivers for their opinion of the Rio Grande cracked gasoline, which has been used exclusively for years by the Los Angeles Police Department. With one exception, these officers praised Rio Grande and admitted that the patented cracking process certainly did give Rio Grande cracks more liveliness and pep than other gasoline. They admitted it was the fastest and most powerful gasoline they had ever used. But one hard-boiled old veteran said, Sure, you got to find gasoline for these new high-powered police cars. Those high-compression engines need a gasoline that's all cracked up. So it'll burn in sugar. But I don't use your Rio Grande cracks in my own car. I've only got an old Ford. And I can't afford your fine, such for ethyl treated cracked gasoline. I buy the cheapest gasoline I can get. Anything's good enough for my old car. Well, that was a challenge the Rio Grande executives couldn't ignore. So he persuaded the officer to try a tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline in the old Ford. And today he received a telephone call from the officer who offered this testimony. Officer, I've never been injured. My old Ford seems to belong in a police car now. It's a new number. It's coming right from top. What's going and now it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Our story tonight goes back quite a few years to the days when science had not yet provided your peace officers with the high-speed criminal catching equipment of today. Had we possessed the teletype and radio when motorcycle patrolman Kramer was killed, our murderer would probably have been in custody within an hour of the time he unwisely fired his gun. This murder committed the arch crime he killed a police officer. Though it may take years, and though the criminal may escape to the ends of the earth, one thing is certain. He who kills a policeman will eventually be brought before the bars of justice to answer for his crime. For every other police officer in the country is sworn to avenge the murder of a brother officer. They never rest until the policeman's killer has either been placed behind prison bars or preferably executed. It is a few days before Christmas. Motorcycle officers Tom Kramer and E.J. Lanise are stationed at the corner of 23rd and Main Street in Los Angeles when a big black touring car careens around the corner near the street car. Kramer whistles for the car to stop, but it rolls on down 23rd Street. Kramer gets over his motor and races off after it. Not that perhaps the race continues until the driver in the black car suddenly slows down, leans out, and punches three shots into the pursuing motorcycle. As Kramer, a bullet in his chest, wavers crazily, crashing into the curb, the big black touring car roars away into the night. Within a few minutes, the detachment of detectives under the leadership of Sergeant Joe Taylor, the present chief of detectives, arrives at the scene. The officers push their way through the silent crowd of the killed body of Officer Kramer, lying under an arc light beside his wrecked motorcycle. Officer Lanise, shaken with grief at the death of his partner, tells his story to Sergeant Taylor. You see, Sergeant, we were parked at the corner of 23rd and Main when a big black car came tearing along. Nearly run into a streetcar. Tom took out after it. 
And a minute later, I went after some bird in the roadster doing about 50. I didn't know anything had happened until I heard the siren on your car. Oh, Toward midnight, while police are combing the city for a suspicious black touring car, Officer Paul Stevens touches a very frightened young girl of 13 in the detective bureau. In the presence of Chief Butler, Detective Lieutenant George K. Holm, and Sergeant Taylor, he tells her story. The market's supposed to be time tonight. So the car drove up and passed ahead of me. Just as I passed it, a man jumped out and grabbed me. I screamed and he hit me. He said he'd kill me if I made any more noise. And I was scared, so, so I kept crying. He stuck a handkerchief under my mouth and tied my hands and feet with another strap. And he tied a trap around my head. And then he got in the car and started off. A little while later, I, I heard a whistle like she's pacing me moving. And then I heard a siren. And then I heard a popping noise like like a power blowing out. You heard a popping noise? Yes, sir. And where did this happen? Oh, I, I was walking down Old Creek Street. Yeah, and Creamer was shot on 23rd. Ties in. Go on with your story, Bruce. Well, after I heard that noise, we go faster and faster. And we left the smooth road and went over some bumpy roads. And then he stopped. And he lifted me out of the car and, and laid me down on the ground. We were way out in the country sitting here in the middle of a big field. Yeah, do you think you could find this field again? Oh, yes, sir. You see, after he took me there for a long time, he said he made a mistake and he kidnapped the wrong girl. So he said if I promised not to tell anybody about it, he'd let me go. I told him I didn't know how to find my way home, so... So he picked me up and carried me across the field to a road, and he gave me a dime and told me to walk straight ahead to the car line. I couldn't walk very well with the strap tied in my ankle, so I sat down and took a nap, and then I ran as fast as I could until I got to the street car line. And then I told the conductor I'd been kidnapped, and here I am. And and now I'd like to go home because my mother will be worried. Uh, yes, Bruce. We'll take you home in just a minute. Well, what street car line was it? Do you remember? Oh, it's dead university, I think. Did he hurt you in any way? Oh, no. He, he just hit me when I screamed. But after that, he was really kind to me. And did you get a good look at this man? No, sir. It was dark and I couldn't see him very well. Well, would you recognize his voice? I don't think so. He was talking whispers and he made me whisper, too. He acted like he was scared. Well, I should think he would. Was he drunk? I don't know. He, he smelled kind of funny, though. Right? Oh, I forgot to tell you. When he was putting the straps on my arms, I bit him. I bit his finger off a hard. He said I nearly bit it off. Do you think you left the scar? Oh, I think I dented it a little anyway. You didn't notice the license number that his car did you? No, sir. I couldn't have seen it because he had the lights off when we were in the field. Uh, you said you had a basket of groceries with you? Yes, sir. What happened to it? Oh. Well, out there in that field, I guess. What was in the basket? Oh, there was a package of bacon, some liver, and two loaves of bread, and a pound of butter. Now, can you think of anything else that happened? Anything that you haven't told us? No, sir. Please leave. I'm not too tired. May I go home now? You bet you may, Ruth. You've been a mighty brave girl, and we appreciate the help you've given us. <laughs> Reported home to her parents, who were on the point of notifying the police of their daughter's disappearance when the officers deliver her to them. And next day, the officers take up Ruth's trail from the end of the University Avenue streetcar line, follow her footprints down the road, pick up the trail of a man which leads them to tire tracks beside a mound of dirt in the middle of the field. Here's a handkerchief. Well, let me see it. Yep. That's the one he used to gag over with, all right. The yeah. old priest? Yeah. Any identification mark? Longer mark, number 405. Uh-huh. Well, we'll have to check that. Hmm. Wonder what's under this mound of dirt. Looks like it's just been turned over. Here you are, George. The groceries the kid bought. Died. Yeah, and I've got a hunchy bay with the gun out there, too. You better call headquarters, Joe, and have them send out a photographer and the man who knows tire marks. Okay. Yeah, and tell them to send some more boys out with speed. I'm sure that this gun is around here somewhere. While Holm and Taylor wait for the men from headquarters, they begin to dig up the ground around the tire tracks with spades borrowed from a nearby rancher. 
But after a half hour of back breaking work, when the photographer and the tire man arrive, they have found nothing. Carefully, the tire man examines the mark. Well, Stephen, what do you say? The rear left wheel carried a six slide Jupiter with a tread slightly worn. The rear right tire is a Stanley Kidney. Well, that's something to go on at any rate. A black touring car with a Jupiter six ply and a Stanley Skidless on the rear wheels. And now, what they could only find that down. Late that afternoon, the officers do dig up the dirt and cut the gun. And while squad, the police hold Los Angeles laundry for the owner of laundry mark number 405. And others are on a keen lookout for a black touring car with the incriminating tires. Chief Butler sends a telegram to the Cold Zone Company. Can you inform us to whom was sold the Colt 32 caliber revolver, number 164256? John L. Butler, Chief of Police, Los Angeles. John L. Butler, Chief of Police, Los Angeles. Our 32 caliber revolver, number 164256, sold to Martin Hardware Company, San Francisco. Chief of Police, San Francisco. Kindly check sale of Colt 32 caliber revolver, number 164256. In time to the Martin Hardware Company in your city. John L. Butler, Chief of Police, Los Angeles. John L. Butler, Chief of Police, Los Angeles. Our record show, Coast Revolver number 164256, armed here June 20th by one Arthur Anderson, and redeemed December 17th. Our officers are attempting to interview Mr. Anderson. Now, Mr. Anderson, we want to know about a gun you pawned last June 20th. Well, I don't know anything about pawning a gun. Where are you on the 20th of December? Right here in San Francisco. When did you last leave San Francisco? Oh, I haven't been out of town for six months. You own a gun, Mr. Anderson? Oh, I used to have one. What kind? Cold, I think it was. 32? Maybe. I'm not sure. Where is it now? Well, I gave it to my brother. And where's your brother? Well, he's in Los Angeles. The last time I heard from him. Where in Los Angeles? Well, you don't think I want to go to pawning my brother, do you? He says that it's withholding information from the police, Mr. Anderson. And the boys down in Los Angeles will find him anyway. So you might as well be smart and play on the side of the law. Oh, uh, all right. Last I heard from Walter, he was living out in Inglewood. Seven, four. Next day, Anderson's brother, Walter, is arrested by Detective Sergeant H.H. H. Klein and Sidney Hitchcock and brought in for questioning. At headquarters, he faces an ominous ring of officers firing questions at him. Why did you kill that motorcycle officer? I didn't. Well, why did you kidnap that little girl? I don't know nothing about it. This is your gun, isn't it? Oh. Where's that black car used for a getaway? I'm innocent. Well, it doesn't look that way to us, Anderson. This gun which we know belongs to your brother in San Francisco, and which he said he lent to you, is the gun which killed Officer Kramer. And we'll prove all that in court, and we'll swing you as sure as you're sitting here. But I, I said I'm innocent. Well, you haven't convinced us yet of that. Well, you see, it was this way. I lent the gun to a friend of mine. Oh, yeah? That sounds familiar. You don't expect us to believe that, do you? Well, all right. Let him alone, boys. Let him tell his story. Go on, Anderson. Well, when I asked my friend to give the gun back to me, he said he'd be ditched it. He wouldn't tell me where. Who was his friend? I don't want to mention no names. Anyway, I see you. Okay, go on. Well, a few days later, my friend came up to my place and asked me to lend him 200 bucks. I told him I didn't have no dough, and that's when he said he'd just have to tell me about the gas. Oh, look here, boys. I can't go through with this. I can't turn in a pal. Right? Maybe you'd rather swing for the job yourself. What's the name of this friend of yours? Uh, his name's Jim Darwin. He said he was planning to kidnap a young kid whose family got dough. But that night he got drunk and grabbed the wrong kid. Before he knew it, though, that speed cop started after him. Well, he was all balled up. He couldn't stand a pinch with his kid all tied in the back seat. So he left the cop a habit. When he saw he bumped the cop off, he sobered up in a hurry. Yeah, imagine he did. So he drove the girl out to the country and turned her loose. Well, where's this Jim Darwin now? I uh, don't know. But he ain't around L.A., that's the thing. Well, who else did this Darwin know in Los Angeles? Uh, he's hanging around with the dame that runs the rooming house over on Grand Avenue. He said he was going to try to get the 200 bucks from her. What number on Grand Avenue? Jim South, I think. What's her name? I don't know her name. She can't miss her. She's short and heavy set. She can't miss her. Taylor, you and Bo better go over there and talk to this woman. Yes, sir, right away. Come on, Bo. A few moments later, Detectives Taylor and Bo are interviewing the landlady at the Grand Avenue address. You're the proprietor here? Yeah. You know a man named Jim Darwin? Oh, he's rooms here. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? I don't know as how that's any of your business. Well, it is our business. You see, we're police officers. What of it? Isn't it true that you and Jim Darwin are 
close friend? I don't have to answer your question. No, you don't. I think you better. They're looking for Jim Darwin on a murder charge. What? Yeah, he murdered a police officer while he was kidnapping a young girl. Where is he? I don't know. He lives here, doesn't he? Yeah, but he ain't here now. So that's what he wanted the $200 for. What did you say? He borrowed $200 from me. Said his mother was dying in Chicago and he had to get to her. When was this? Just before Christmas. And you lent him the money? Yeah. Then you were close to him. Yeah. I loved him, I guess. What did he tell you about the murder? Nothing. I don't know nothing about it. Sure of that? Positive. Has his room been rented? No, I've been keeping it for him. I thought he'd be back soon. Looks like he won't now, though. I wouldn't think so. What's in his room? Mm, right here. Oh, next door to yours, eh? Quite convenient. Got a key to it? Yeah. Open it up. And you've got to have a search warrant. Hey, one. listen, if you're smart, you won't give us any trouble. You know we can get a search warrant in 15 minutes, so why be tough? Just open up that room. All right. There's a picture of him on the door? Yeah. These here handkerchiefs in this drawer? I guess so. Look here, boy. What? These handkerchiefs all have the laundry mark number 405. Mm. Same as the handkerchief he used to jag that kid with. Yes, that's clear as Mr. Anderson. Yeah, no question about it now. Jim Darwin is the man we want. Well, you'll never get him, I can tell you. He's too smart for you coppers. Nevertheless, the officers stake out Darwin's room for several days in the hope that he may attempt to return to see his nominal office. The photograph of Darwin is reproduced on circulars and sent to peace officers all over the United States. And on January 9th, the taciturn landlady on Grand Avenue, after repeated questioning, admits that Darwin had another address in Inglewood. Taylor and Bowie immediately drive out to the house, only to find. Doesn't look as though anyone was living here, Bowie. Nope. No curtains on the window, no furniture in the room. Let's have a look around back. All right. Hmm. Garage door is locked. We'll grab that rock there. We'll open it quick enough. Okay. I'll say, uh, look, we have questions in the country. See some next door neighbor. Gentlemen looking for someone? Yeah. He lived in this house last. Mr. Lawrence, but he moved. How long ago? Oh, sometime before Christmas. Say so his name was Lawrence, eh? That's what he called himself. What's in this garage? I don't know. Take a track of that padlock with the rock, though. Hey, 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 now look here. Now, you, you can't go break him into there. No, we're doing it. Well, I'll call the police. Now, that's what I'll no, do. and save I... it. Where are the police? The uh, uh, police? Well, 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 what seems to be the matter? A little murder case. Murder? Oh, well, there we are, Joe. There we are. Pull it off. All right. A black touring car. Yeah. You say, look, on the rear wheel. And this kid is on the right, and there's six flies Jupiter on the left. This is a getaway car, no mistake. Uh, you say Mr. Lawrence left here for Christmas? Yeah. Where'd he go? Well, he said he had to go east. His mother was sick. Did you see him drive in here on the 17th of December? Well, uh, no, I, I don't remember date. You say he left here just before Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Well, was he driving the car the last few days before he left? Uh, come to think of it, uh, he wasn't. I, I remember remarking to the missus that was strange Mr. Lawrence was using the streetcar. I don't think he used his automobile after that morning he cleaned off the driveway. What's that? Well, uh, one morning early, I saw him driving into the garage. And he got out and scraped the muddy tracks from the driveway and then washed the driveway with a hose. Funny thing, too. It looked like rain that day. Mm, covering up, though. Yeah. Could that have been the morning of the 17th of December? Oh, well, it could have been, but of course I can't be sure. I, I never was much of a hand for remembering dates. <laughs> From the black murder car, police obtained fingerprints of the wanted man, and these were his picture of broadcast across the country. But months go by, and the unwavering vigilance of the Los Angeles officers goes unrewarded. Then, nearly a year later, a citizen in taxpayer calls on Lieutenant Holm at the detective bureau. Lieutenant Holm? <clears throat> My name is Randolph. John Randolph. Yes, Mr. Randolph. You investigated that murder of a police officer last Christmas, didn't you? Yes, I worked on that case. Well, I just returned from a business trip to Mexico, and something happened down there that I thought you'd be interested in. Yes? I was visiting a friend of mine, Don Romero, who has a big cattle ranch down in Sonora, near Hermosillo. Yeah, go on. Well, <clears throat> while I was there, one of 
the cowboys struck up an acquaintance with me, noticed the California plate on my car, and started to ask me a lot of questions about Los Angeles, and particularly about the murder of that policeman. Now, it struck me funny that he was so interested in that case, and I felt it my duty to tell you about it as soon as I got back. What is the name of this fellow? Don Romero said his name was Jim Berwin. Jim Berwin. Berwin? Darwin. Don't tell her. Yes, George. Bring in that Darwin circular, will you? Right away. Did this fellow give you any reason for being so interested in the Kramer killing? Well, <clears throat> he said he knew a man who was a friend of the officers. There you are, George. All right, fine, thanks. Now, Mr. Randolph, did your cowboy look anything like this? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, that's a very good picture of it. Fine. Go pack your bag. You're leaving for Hermosillo, Mexico, to arrest a cowboy named Jim Bourbon for the murder of Tom Kramer. Thirty-six hours later, Taylor and Bo leave the railway at Hermosillo and, hiring a rickety jeepney, begin the long, bumpy trip across the rolling green range of northern Sonora. Hours later, they approach the hacienda of Don Romero. Patron! Patron! Mira! Don't change the channel! Yes. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Hello, sir, senor. Uh, welcome to the hacienda of Don Romero. All right. Are you Don Romero? At your service, senor. I'm Detective Sergeant Taylor of the Los Angeles Police Department. This is Detective Sergeant Paul. I am honored, senor. You will be so kind as to accept the humble comforts of my agenda. Thanks, Don O'Malley, but we will have to dispense with all now. It isn't yet to the point. Oh, you my son, always in a hurry. Bueno, uh, what is the, uh, as you say, point? We're looking for a cowboy that works for you. Name of Jim Berwin. Jim Berwin? Yes, where is he? Oh, he is, Charlie. He's gone. Gone? He's yes, in He talked one day with his countrymen of yours. The mi amigo, Senor Randolph. Uh, next day, Senor Randolph uh, leaves for Los Angeles. The day after that, uh, if a care of Berwin, he leaves too. <laughs> it is hard to understand the Americano. Well, where did he go? He did not stop to say, Senor. You see, when he left, some things of value left with him. more months go by with no word of the murderer. And then, nearly 3,000 miles away, in the little town of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, two men meet in a saloon. I've been looking for you, Juan. Yeah, what's that? Listen, I want you to keep away from Margie. Yeah? She's my dang thief. Well, I should think she'd have something to say about that. I'm telling you over the last time she's mine. That's not what she told me. You lie. Oh, go on. See this. Why can't you be a good loser? Hey, bartender. Give me a good... Ah. Why never regains consciousness? And police, provided by witnesses with a description of the killer who is known in Greensburg as Edward Melly, throw a dragnet around Allegheny County. Then, 24 hours later, a confused gentleman walks into the north side police station in Pittsburgh. Yes, sir. What is it? Well, Tom, I don't know whether I'd be after seeing things or what, but I was just walking home from work. And as I was passing under the Fort Wayne Railroad Bridge on Merchant Street, I seen a man's foot sticking out. Well, I yelled him, and the foot pulled right out of sight. What? As sure as I'm wrong, that's what I seen. He, he must be between the tracks in the sheep iron field over the street. Uh, uh, maybe he's stuck or something. Well, he'll investigate it right away. The man hiding in the bridge refuses to give himself up, and quick witted Officer McNulty plans a harmless way of ejecting him. Come out now. Out 
Standard Time and 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 